Our next speaker is Dr. Calvin Beisner. Calvin Beisner is an interdisciplinary scholar specializing on the application of biblical worldview theology and ethics to economics, environmental stewardship, political philosophy, public policy, and apologetics. He's the founder and national spokesman of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. Dr. Beisner has testified as an expert witness on theology, ethics, science, and economics of, of climate change policy before the U.S. Senate Environment and Public Works Committee of the Energy and Environment Subcommittee of the U.S. House of Representatives. He's a former associate professor of historical theology and social ethics at Knox Theological Seminary, where he taught church history, ethics, apologetics, logic, and systematic theology. Dr. Beisner is a frequent radio talk show guest with such nationally syndicated programs as Janet Parshall's In the Market, Brian Fisher's Focal Point, and several Salem Radio Network programs. He's written 11 books and over 200 articles and book reviews, many contributions. Now, one of the reasons that I'm just skipping through Dr. Beisner's uh, bio is if you ever get a chance to look through it on time, uh, uh, online, it's not only impressive, it's pretty close to mind-blowing. He's been published just about everywhere. He's spoken just about everywhere. And his expertise is generally unparalleled even in the Christian community, much less in the secular community. Now, with that, he's here to speak on the subject of understanding Gordon Clark. I understand that this is an Orthodox Presbyterian church. But Gordon Clark is, you know, more than an enigmatic figure. He's one of the most uh, influential philosophers of the last hundred years, especially within the Reformed and Presbyterian community. So at this time, Dr. Beisner has been kind enough to come here and introduce this person to us and try to give us some kind of an understanding of his thought and his influence. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Beisner. Thank you, Chris. Um, I actually have plans for saying some, uh, some other things and was going to do them very first, but instead I'm going to put those last um, after more folks are here. So let me do a quick note to remind myself of that. Uh, Chris mentioned that I uh, lead a ministry called the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, and I'll just quickly uh, describe that for you. This is, I mean, since... Since God created a universe, not a pluriverse, it is not the case that this is utterly unrelated to my talk, but it's pretty close. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation is a network of about 60 scholars, all evangelical Christians, many of them reformed. Uh, roughly a third of them are natural scientists. Uh, another third are economists and policy wonks. And the other third are theologians, philosophers, ethicists. And we work together uh, to promote, through educational activities, uh, three things simultaneously. Biblical earth stewardship, which is not the same thing as environmentalism, because we actually have biblical worldview and theology and ethics at our foundation. And we try to use good science and good economics so that our policies actually uh, would be helpful to the natural world around us and not harmful to the world's poor, whereas most environmentalism uses lousy science and lousy economics and has anti-Christian worldview, theology, and ethics and promotes policies that actually don't do much good for the natural environment but are very harmful to the world's poor. Uh, so that's our first one, biblical earth stewardship, which we also describe uh, using the, the title Godly Dominion out of Genesis 1.28 as men and women created in God's image working lovingly together to enhance the fruitfulness, the beauty, and the safety of the earth to the glory of God and the benefit of our neighbors so that we're really addressing the two great commandments to love God and to love neighbor. So first one, biblical earth stewardship. Second one, economic development for the poor. Uh, don't think in terms of America's so-called poor. Uh, people in America whose income is at the poverty threshold, as defined by the federal government, have more purchasing power than the average person in Western Europe, France, Germany, Spain, UK, places like that. Uh, so to call them poor is something of a misnomer. Think instead in terms of places like Sub-Saharan Africa and, of course, parts of Asia and Latin America. Haiti would be a good example. Uh, where people live on less than a dollar and a quarter a day or so and 
have very high rates of disease and premature death. And we want to promote economic development in places like that by t helping people to understand the importance first of a set of social institutions without which no society has ever grown out of poverty, including private property, private property rights, and legal codified recognition of private property rights so that private, private pro property actually turns into capital that can be used to create wealth. And then also uh, entrepreneurship, freedom of trade, and limited government and the rule of law. Those social institutions are absolutely crucial historically to any or, uh, society rising out of poverty. And we believe that they're also well supported biblically. And then the second thing that is indispensable to any society growing out of poverty is access to abundant, affordable, reliable energy. And uh, the reason for that is simply that energy is what enables us to do anything. And the calories you eat in a day are not nearly sufficient to give you enough energy to produce light and refrigeration and air conditioning and shoes and shirts and, and all the other things that all of us in America take for granted. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of us consume under 3,000 calories a day, I hope, um, and yet you, that's not actually true. That's just food intake. Your actual caloric consumption per day is more on the order of 190,000 because that's the calories and the energy that you use each day. But you get that not through what you take into your mouth, but through what comes to all of us through the electricity grid. And that energy is what allows us to get the result of a whole lot more work than we could possibly do with our own bodies. By the way, that also is what allowed, uh, what, what enabled uh, a lot of the elimination of slavery in the world. Uh, you need a lot of labor done well, you can get it done by animals, you can get it done by slaved, enslaved human beings, or you can get it done by electricity and uh, natural gas, things like that. At any rate, access to abundant, affordable, reliable energy is indispensable to rising and staying out of poverty. And unfortunately, a lot of the uh, policies that are promoted by environmentalists, uh, especially as solutions to alleged dangerous man-made global warming, deprive people of access to abundant, affordable, reliable energy, and therefore condemn them to more generations of abject poverty and the high rates of disease and premature death that always accompany that. So, biblical earth stewardship, economic development for the very poor, and finally the proclamation and defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, in confrontation with attempts by much of the green movement to as they explicitly put it, green the gospel, to change gospel teaching into something like, if you love God, take good care of the earth. Now, it's true, if you love God, you should want to take good care of the earth, but that's not gospel. Take good care of the earth is imperative. It's a command, right? That means it's law. Gospel is indicative. It's a statement of fact. It's a statement of what God did. And it is not law. It is gospel. It is good news. So law and gospel are fundamentally distinct from each other, and the notion that take good care of the earth is gospel is quite mistaken, and it's actually a form of legalism. But unfortunately, funded by hundreds of millions of dollars poured into it by left-wing organizations, uh, foundations, uh, over the last 23, 24 years, um, uh, the Green Movement has infiltrated a lot of even evangelical churches and created a whole movement that is quite prone to that. So our aim is to preserve and protect and, and proclaim the true gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen you know, by the disciples, by up to 500 others at one time, and of course, last of all, by Paul himself as one born out of due time. So this is the gospel. And we are seeking to intertwine our work in all three of those things together uh, to, uh, to serve God and to be of service to our, our fellow human beings. Um, <clears throat> I have, uh, this of course is not the topic of my talk at all, right? Uh, 
but I just wanted to give you some idea of what we do. I have three handouts down here, um, enough copies of a couple of them for everybody, one of them we're running short on, uh, that are also not the topic of my talk. They are related to our work, but I would encourage you to pick these up just to get to know a little bit more about what we do and the primary battle that we are fighting right now, which is to prevent the adoption of policies at local, state, national, and even global levels to try to mitigate man-made global warming. I should say, just for clarity's sake, we do not deny that adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere probably has some warming effect. We believe that the empirical evidence is that that effect is very, very small, vanishingly small. In terms of basic physics, you know it's got to be there, but it's not measurable. And it's certainly not dangerous, and it's certainly not worth spending trillions, literally trillions of dollars trying to mitigate that. And uh, the efforts to do so are among the most dangerous uh, to, to our world, not just in terms of the economic effects, but also even in terms of, of basic liberty. One of the handouts is a copy of an article that I had published in townhall.com last Saturday was then picked up by cnsnews.com and then by stream.org called What Threatens Liberty and Increases Abortion, Human Trafficking, Government Debt, and Poverty? And the answer is climate alarmism. And you might scratch your head and say, increases abortion and human trafficking? Yeah, read the article, you'll understand how. It's an amazing, amazing linkage and what's very sad is that somebody like Pope Francis, who, when he first became Pope, told his bishops that one of their chief uh, priorities during his papacy would be to, uh, to fight human trafficking, is endorsing policies on climate change that will have the ironic, exact opposite effect of actually promoting more human trafficking. So, uh, now, let me turn to the, uh, the actual prepared talk, um, I was asked to, to make some reflections on the philosophy and particularly the epistemology of Gordon H. Clark. And uh, I decided in doing this to, to concentrate most of the lecture on simply a simple introduction to the basics of his epistemology. Uh, and yet also uh, in the request for me to speak there was the request for me to make some reflections on what is known in the OPC circles and, and other reform circles as the Clark Van Til controversy. I will get to that near the end of the lecture, but if you, were, if you were waiting for some fireworks about that, I will tell you now, you will be disappointed. So I'm going to focus uh, pretty exclusively on Clark's epistemology. Clark believed that Christian apologetics must address not only matters of theological prolegomena, uh, the existence and nature of God, the inspiration and authority of scripture, the historicity of biblical persons and events, especially of Jesus Christ and his bodily resurrection, etc., but also the implications of the Christian faith, that is, the teaching of scripture on every aspect of human life, private and public, personal and social, for he believed that scripture does have implications for all aspects of life, and that because it does, it is important to defend those implications against attacks, just as it is important to defend what most would see as its more prominent central doctrines. He wrote over 40 books, including, by the way, a systematic theology, the manuscript which was, of which was only recently discovered, uh, which his grandson now hopes to uh, get published, and which I expect I shall read with great relish. He wrote many, many articles and many lectures addressing every branch of philosophy, plus history, various divisions of natural science, economics, ethics, politics, and more. And though I personally find everything he wrote fascinating, it would be impossible to treat the broad spectrum of his thought even tolerably, let alone well, in a single short lecture, or even in a long one. For this lecture, therefore, I think it most profitable to confine ourselves to his epistemology, that is, his doctrine of knowledge, what we know, how we know, which is probably the aspect of his thought that has been the most divisive in broader Christian circles because of his presuppositionalism, 
and in narrower reformed circles because of his disagreements with and critiques of the epistemologies of Hermann Doyeverd and more prominently and importantly in American reformed circles, Cornelius Van Til. I will not try to document all or even many of my descriptions of Clark's thought by specific quotations from his work. I've written this lecture as one who studied Clark intently for about 15 years, uh, from the late 1980s to the early 2000s, but whose attention has for the last dozen or so years been on quite different matters. So instead, I'll give you what I uh, hear, what is more, uh, what I as a serious student of Clark's perspective on, on uh, pardon me, start that sentence over. So instead, what I'll give you here is more what I, as a serious student of Clark, perceive on reflection at some distance to have been the most important epistemological lessons I learned from him. It is entirely possible, therefore, that some of what I say might more accurately describe his impact on my thinking than his own thinking per se. If that's so, it won't be the first time a great thinker's disciple has succumbed to some revisionism not even the first time for a disciple of a famous reformed presuppositionalist. So part one, Clark's presuppositionalism. I shall begin with Clark's presuppositionalism in the most basic general terms with particular attention to its relevance to his understanding of what knowledge is and with what I hope will calm the anxieties of some who think his theory of knowledge leaves them with precious little understanding of the world around them or even of themselves. By knowledge, Clark meant specifically justified true belief. By justified, he meant belief that was either axioms or propositions validly deduced from axioms. Therefore, in Clark's epistemology, knowledge is limited to axioms and their logical implications. Now, as an aside, it is common for some reformed apologists to think that reformed presuppositionalism is unique, or nearly so, in embrace of this view of the justification of knowledge. It is not, however. Uh, my own first exposure to presuppositionalism, though not by that name, was in a philosophy course taught by the late Dr. Dallas Willard at the University of Southern California, who later mentored Greg Bonson toward his PhD in philosophy and had a strong influence on many other apologists of Greg's and my generation. Dr. Willard assigned us to read a very small book by the Catholic philosopher Roderick Chisholm entitled The Problem of the, of the Criterion, which was a brilliant short demonstration that without undefended axioms as starting points, reasoning could never get started. And therefore, no conclusion could be justified. Um, uh, Chisholm called these not presuppositions, but uh, 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 particulars. And he was a defender of a system that he called particularism. These were the criteria of knowledge. Um, it wasn't until about a decade later when I first began reading Clark and Van Til and a few other reformed presuppositionalists that I recognized their presuppositionalism as one variety of the axiomatic or particularist epistemology that Chisholm represented. Now, Clark's axiom, using the singular collectively, was the word of God, i.e., Clark's axioms, using the plural specifically, are the thoughts of God, which so far as man's access to them is concerned, for God surely has thoughts that he has not revealed to us, indeed he has told us so, are the content of the Bible alone and the Bible in its entirety in its original autographs, to borrow the language of the original doctrinal basis of the Evangelical Theological Society of which Clark was one of the founders. It follows that in Clark's epistemology, we know nothing but what the Bible says or logically implies, which of course means that we don't know that we're, that we're here in this room right now, which seems really silly 
until you begin to understand a bit more of what he means by knowledge and how he distinguishes it. But we must be careful not to misunderstand Clark. Many think Clark's epistemology implies the rejection of science, history, engineering, etc., as valueless, other than such as might be explicitly or implicitly revealed in scripture. Some go farther and think Clark was an idealist who denied the objective reality of the, ex of the external world. Neither is so, as Clark's quite broad and deep acquaintance and fascination with botany, history, and economics, among other disciplines, demonstrated. While Clark did say those yielded no knowledge, justified true belief, they were still useful. They could yield opinions, opinions, that when acted upon could be more or less effective at achieving various ends. When he spoke of knowledge, he distinguished it, as did Plato, from opinion. Knowledge is by definition both true belief and justified belief. Opinions, by contrast, might be either true or false. But even when true could not be justified, that is, even if they are true, we can't know them to be true. That is, they would not constitute part of our knowledge. Now, it's important also to understand what Clark meant when he said a belief was justified. He didn't mean that it was a belief lots of people would agree with, or even a belief that when acted upon could lead to useful practice. He meant it was a belief that followed by valid inference from true axioms known to be true. That is, the axioms of scripture. Thus, for example, Clark would call knowledge the belief that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct persons, yet one God, the Trinity, because that was validly deduced from propositions in scripture. However, he would call opinion my belief upon looking to my left at a street curb and seeing a car 30 feet away coming toward me at 45 miles per hour, that I would put my life at risk if I stepped out into the street. That opinion might be true, and if I acted upon it, I'd probably be safer than if I didn't, but it would not be knowledge because it would not have been deduced from the axioms of scripture. And some would protest, however, that this belief was justified by inference from my sensory perception of the car 35 feet away coming at 45 miles an hour and my direct past experience or others' direct past experience communicated to me by their testimony of what happens when someone is hit by a car traveling at, 35, at 45 miles per hour and of the very low probability that a driver would be able to stop or swerve in time to miss me if I were to step out in front of him. Now, Clark would respond, I suspect, it's my opinion, I cannot know for sure if it's so, that while the opinion was justified as an opinion, a belief that whether true or false could still be the basis of a practical judgment, it still would not deserve the label knowledge because A, it wasn't validly deduced from axioms and B, the premises from which it was derived, whether validly or invalidly, were not known to be true. Clark sought to persuade people of this through his many critiques of empiricism. In the case of this illustration, he could point out that I couldn't be sure that I wasn't dreaming this or that I wasn't hallucinating or that there wasn't some large mirror placed just to my left that was reflecting a car actually coming from my right, or that my calculation of the car's speed was mistaken. I experienced a similar mistaken perception while driving up from the uh, California coast in my youth. Having been on the road for about 13 hours and it by then being late at night, I suddenly perceived a locomotive barreling toward me just ahead and realized with terror that I was about to uh, miss a curve to the right in the highway and crash into the train. I swerved just in time to make the curve and then realized as I came fully awake that what I'd seen had been a billboard. At least to this day, I think it was a billboard. That is my opinion. There were, or at least I think I perceived that there were, lots of trees around and obscuring it. Perhaps I dreamt the whole thing. I didn't go back to check. I just drove on the next couple of miles into Eureka, quite shaken but very much awake, and stopped and slept. 
What people object to when Clark insists that knowledge is limited to the propositions in scripture and valid deductions from them is, is a caricature. The notion that this means we're left with nothing but nearly comprehensive skepticism and so we never believe anything and never act on our beliefs in anything other than the propositions of scripture and valid deductions from them. Clark, however, simultaneously affirmed his epistemology and chose to eat the scrambled eggs on his plate rather than the plate. He was content with life in a world in which we act on many beliefs that are opinions, not knowledge, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Indeed, it is unavoidable, and often enough, it serves our ends tolerably effectively. I just came up with another illustration of this uh, a couple of nights ago. I was staying with some good friends in Washington, D.C. Uh, for, two uh, for, for uh, Tuesday night, and uh, both of them had been students of Clark's when he studied there, and uh, one of them uh, had, had been an art student, and Dr. Clark liked to paint. He was an awful painter, but he really liked to paint. And so she would often find herself in what was called the art barn at Covenant College at the same time that he was there. And they would perhaps be painting the same scene, seen through the window out in front of them. And uh, you know, she had the freedom of an, as an artist to decide to exclude some of the trees and to paint sort of uh, uh, a little bit creatively. Clark, interestingly enough, insisted on putting every tree into the painting. He did it badly. It, they were not well shown, but he insisted on putting every tree there. Now, if he was the comprehensive empirical skeptic that some of his critics think he is, what explains that, right? All right. That those who represent Clark as rejecting the value of all sources of opinion other than scripture misunderstand him is demonstrable, insofar as my, any opinion is demonstrable, a qualifier that should bring to our attention the fact that words have a range of meaning, what I mean by demonstrable in this case is similar to, but not identical to, what I'd mean by saying that the doctrine of the Trinity is demonstrable. The doctrine of the Trinity is demonstrable by valid deduction from the propositions of scripture. This opinion is de demonstrable in a weaker sense of the word. Weaker precisely because the propositions in an argument leading to it are not part of scripture. So please keep that in mind. If either Clark or I sometimes say we know that, for instance, George Washington, my second cousin eight times removed, was, so was Benedict Arnold, by the way, was the first president of the United States, even though that's not revealed in scripture. For even the word know has a range of meanings, and which meaning it has in a given instance must be determined by the context. Okay, to start that sentence over and leave out all the aside there, that those who represent Clark as rejecting the value of all sources of opinion other than scripture misunderstand him, is demonstrable by the fact that although he insisted that experience yields no knowledge, he often wrote quite clearly of the value of experience and some opinions derived from it, such as many facts of botany, a subject he loved, a value that stopped short of qualifying them as knowledge, it is true, but nonetheless, a value. A hundred dollar bill is, after all, not valueless merely because it's not a thousand dollar bill. For example, in his critique of logical positivism in his book, The Three, Ty uh, Three Types of Religious Philosophy, having pointed out that logical positivism stipulated that, quote, a sentence is meaningful as opposed to being nonsense only if it is verifiable by sensory experience, unquote, which, by the way, he did point out was self-refuting and therefore not true. He then wrote, explaining the meaning of verifiability, quote, for a long time the assertion, the other side of the moon has no mountains, could not be actually verified or falsified. But it was meaningful, to proponents of logical positivism, because it was verifiable in principle. A few people have now seen the other side of the moon and their experience discovers whether the assertion is true or false. Now you can't be the absolute empirical skeptic and write that. 
that, se that second sentence would be inconsistent with the belief that experience is of no epistemic value, but it is consistent with the belief, which was Clark's, that experience is of epistemic value as evidence for or against opinion, even if not as evidence for or against knowledge. Now, some people have called Clark's epistemology fideism and have thought that that was sufficient to debunk it. On the one hand, Clark actually embraced the label, though he preferred the confessedly pejorative term dogmatism, because dogmatism, he said, is a pointed term that pricks one's attention. <laughs> On the other hand, Clark rejected the meanings usually attached to fideism. Popular opinion often views fideism as arbitrary. One believes something regardless whether it's reasonable to do so, or even perhaps precisely because it is unreasonable to do so. Though, of course, that means the unreasonableness has been made the reason for doing so. So this is a self-refuting system as well. But that's OK. That's the way Søren Kierkegaard insisted that becoming a Christian requires a blind leap of faith. Now, much scholarly opinion holds that fideism, as Alvin Plantinga put it, exclusive or basic reliance upon faith alone, accompanied by a consequent disparagement of reason and utilized especially in the pursuit of philosophical or religious truth, a reliance that may go on to disparage and denigrate reason. Clark, however, because he rejected the popular definition of faith as something extra or contra-rational, and believed instead, because he was convinced scripture defined the term this way, that faith is assent to an understood proposition, rejected both definitions of fideism. For Clark, faith and reason are neither contrary nor logically unrelated. Rather, reason starts with faith. With Augustine, he would say, credo ut intelligam, I believe in order that I might understand. But be careful. This doesn't mean one starts with faith, which is devoid of understanding, and progresses to understanding. Rather, faith being assent to an understood proposition, <clears throat> uh, I believe in order that I might understand, means I believe some things that I understand, e.g. the explicit propositions of scripture, in order that from them I may come both to understand and believe other things. For instance, uh, propositions validly deduced from scripture that for now I don't understand. And even in order that I might come to understand and believe yet other things that are matters of opinion because not deduced from scripture. That is, believing the axioms of scripture not only leads in the inquisitive mind to believing those axioms' logical implications, but also to believing other things about the external world not revealed in scripture. The first category of beliefs Clark called knowledge, the second opinion. Now granted, Clark's definition of faith as assent to an understood proposition, fideism by definition cannot be extra or contra rational. The, world, the word is derived from the Latin fides, belief, faith, trust, from the verb fido, I believe, I have faith, I trust, and the translation of the Greek pistuo, I believe, I have faith, I trust. Thus, I think that fideism for Clark simply meant presuppositionalism. That is, the belief that all valid reasoning and hence all knowledge begins with starting points propositions logically prior to which there are none because that is the definition of starting points. To believe that the Bible is the word of God is not arbitrary, however. For the Bible claims to be the word of God, no argument has ever successfully refuted that claim, and while other starting points, such as empiricism and rationalism or dependence on other alleged divine revelations, fail to deliver knowledge, taking the Bible as axiomatic yields a great deal of knowledge. And coupling that knowledge with opinion that we gain by other means, taking the Bible as axiomatic, yields also a great deal of highly defensible opinion about such things as history, chemistry, astronomy, economics, and even music. So for Clark, fideism is not arbitrary. 
neither does fideism require disparaging reason. On the contrary, fideism alone provides the starting points without which reason is fruitless, i.e. yields no justified true beliefs, no knowledge. Clark did not defend scripture as axiomatic, if by defend we mean to present a positive case for it from something outside itself. That would be a contradiction in terms. Axioms are starting points. And by definition, there is nothing earlier in a chain of reasoning than a starting point. But while Clark did not defend scripture as axiomatic, he did defend his belief that scripture is axiomatic, and he did so in two ways. First, positively, he asserted that scripture is the word of God and showed that scripture contained the propositions from which this assertion could be validly deduced. That is, he showed that scripture asserted itself in some instances explicitly and in others implicitly as the word of God and therefore axiomatic. Second, to answer objections against this axiom, he argued in two ways. The first was to argue that every alternative starting point for epistemology failed to justify any belief, therefore resulted in no claims of knowledge, or rather, no valid claims of knowledge. And this was the use of his critiques of both rationalism and empiricism. The second was to argue that no proposition either explicit in scripture or validly deduced from it could be demonstrated to be false. And therefore, all attempts to demonstrate that scripture failed as an axiom also failed. And that left scripture undefeated. Now, Clark also believed, however, because he thought scripture taught this, that one's belief that scripture is God's word, in other words, that it is axiomatic, could come about only by the enlightening action of the Holy Spirit, not as a result of a chain of reasoning. And this, again, he believed because he thought scripture taught it. In commenting on the Westminster Confession of Faith, 1.5, he acknowledged that archaeology could contribute something toward proving that the historical events of the Bible are true, though little or nothing toward proving that the doctrines are. Notice, by the way, how his wording there, that archaeology could contribute something toward proving the historical events of the Bible are true, militates against the misapprehension that he thought extra-biblical grounds for belief were valueless. But to go on, how, can, how then can we know that the Bible is true, he asked? The confession answers, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority of the scripture is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit. And Clark went on to say, faith is a gift or work of God. It is God who causes us to believe. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, Psalm 65, verse 4. Notice, by the way, that when Clark here says faith is a gift of God, he means, as the context makes clear, specifically this faith, namely that, that the Bible is God's word. He affirms the same elsewhere of faith in the gospel but he would not say it of faith generically for, for example, faith that if we rid ourselves of all desire, we shall experience nirvana and be absorbed into Brahman is faith in a falsehood, and God does not give us that. So for Clark, all knowledge, all justified true belief, consists of our believing propositions either explicit in or validly deduced from scripture. Opinions are all other propositions that we believe, some of which might be true, though we can never know them to be true, and some of which undoubtedly are false. Opinions invalidly deduced from scripture might be true, but our invalid deduction doesn't entail our knowing them to be true. They might also, of course, be false. And opinions deduced from other sources, experience, secondhand testimony, authority, etc., might also be true, but again, we cannot know them to be true. But that's okay we still manage to muddle through a great deal of life based on opinion. One hopes, however, for a more sure foundation for our beliefs about God, sin, and salvation than either empiricism or rationalism, let alone existentialism and other forms of irrationalism. And thankfully, scripture gives that to us. 
As Peter put it, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. By the way, if you think that's an indication of an empiricist epistemology inherent in scripture, I would ask you to define how the eye perceives, how the eye witnesses majesty. You know, what color is majesty? How big is it, right? Uh, but Peter says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, and we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter Chapter 1, verses 17 and 19 through 21. Now part two, and this will be considerably shorter, the Clark Van Til controversy. What I have said thus far will probably encounter little resistance among most reformed presuppositionalists. Perhaps with the exception of Clark's definition of faith, which I know is controversial, but which I believe most critics badly misunderstand, and I invite them to tangle with Clark's careful, thorough, and detailed discussion and critique of the various alternative definitions of faith in his book, Faith and Saving Faith. I turn now to more controversial ground, namely his objections to what I have come to designate Cornelius Van Til's epistemological idiosyncrasies. Here I expect I will step on some toes. If yours are among them, I beg your patience, your forgiveness, and your readiness to reassess. Years ago, I read the complete OPC General Assembly and Philadelphia Presbytery minutes related to what became and still is known as the Clark Van Til controversy. I also read various histories of the controversy. One, has, one was written pretty much contemporaneously with it as a series of articles by the theologian Herman Hooksema in The Standard Bearer, the magazine of the Protestant Reformed Church, which later were republished as the book, The Clark Van Til Controversy. Another of the more important ones was the, cha the chapter on it in uh, John Frame's Cornelius Van Til, An Analysis of His Thought. And in preparing for this lecture, I reviewed these and the discussions of the Clark Van Til Controversy and Greg Bonson's Van Til's Apologetic, Readings and Analysis, and John Meathers, Cornelius Van Til, Reformed Apologist and Churchman. I am now about to disappoint many, probably most, perhaps all of you. But if you are, as I expect you will be, disappointed by what I am about to say, I ask you to think soberly about why you are disappointed. How am I going to disappoint you? By declining to rehearse the controversy in depth, to assess the arguments pro and con, and to seek to justify my judgments of the two protagonists or antagonists, depending on your point of view, positions and their arguments for them. Instead, I will sketch the controversy only very briefly, even superficially, and indicate my conclusions about it with little attempt to justify them. Why? For two reasons. First, because godly men who have studied the controversy in much greater depth than I have, ar have argued about it at a a great length and still have failed to persuade each other. And I don't think I can, even, at a, even in a major treatment, let alone a brief lecture like this, do any better than they. Second, because after doing this, I wanna conclude by addressing something I consider to be much more important to the health of Christ's church. So here's my sketch of the controversy. I understand it to have been largely though not exclusively, over Van Til's doctrines that all human knowledge is exclusively analogical of God's knowledge and that all truth is necessarily paradoxical. Now, the first challenge is to understand rightly what Van Til meant by these two terms, and that is admittedly quite a challenge. Van Til's defenders and critics alike acknowledge that he often expressed himself in ways that others, even intelligent and well-studied, found very difficult to understand. Bonson, for instance, could write of, quote, the tremendous philosophical and linguistic confusion on all sides that has swirled around the debate, unquote. 
Frame could write at the end of his survey of the controversy, quote, it is time for us to admit that these issues should never have been raised in such confusing terminology. Let us begin with the doctrine that man's knowledge is always analogical to God's. I'll start by offering some standard uh, definitions and explanations of analogy. The clearest and most precise discussion of analogy I have seen occupies 11 pages of H.W.B. Joseph's Introduction to Logic, of which the following statements are helpful excerpts, though they leave out a great deal. Analogy, he writes, meant originally identity of relation. Four terms, when the first stands to the second, as the third stands to the fourth, were said to be analogous or to exhibit an analogy. If the relation is really the same one in either case, that is between either sets of two, right, either pairs, then what follows from the relation in one case follows from it in the other, provided that it really follows from the relation and not from something else. For example, if in respect of weight, A is to B as C is to D, and if A weighs twice as much as B, then C must weigh twice as much as D. There is, however, he continued, another sense in which the terms analogy and argument from analogy are used. The analogy may be any resemblance between two things, and not merely a resemblance of the relations in which they respectively stand to two other things. And the argument from analogy is an argument from some degree of resemblance to a further resemblance, not an argument from the consequences of a relation in one case to its consequences in another. Expressed symbolically, the argument hitherto was of the following type. A is related to B as C is to D. From the relation of A to B, such and such a consequence follows, therefore it follows also from the relation of C to D. The present argument, this more extended form of, an, of analogy, will run thus. A resembles B in certain respects. Uh, pardon me, he says, yeah. Um, and then uh, in, in respects X. A resembles B in certain respects X. A exhibits the character Y. Therefore, B will exhibit the character Y also. Now, distinct from these uses is that of analogy specifically in theology where analogy is thought to provide a sort of halfway house between univocal and equivocal language about God. Univocal language is language that has a clear, specific, certain meaning that, that all the participants in the conversation understand. Equivocal is language where uh, the, a, a term might mean one of several different things, and often it's unclear which one it means in a given context, and the participants in the discussion might actually not be agreed as to that meaning. Right? Um, uh, analogy in theological use is thought to provide a sort of halfway house between univocal and equivocal language about God. Some theologians have thought the creator-creature distinction implies that no quality predicated of God can be identical to that quality predicated of anything else. And therefore, they have asserted that univocal language about God is necessarily false. Yet to confine ourselves to equivocal language about God is in fact to say nothing about him. It has been thought, therefore, that some middle way must be taken and that way has been called analogy and a theological statement has been held to be an analogy if it is neither wholly univocal nor wholly equivocal. The objection to this has been that it either admits of some univocal elements in propositions about God, or it excludes all univocal elements. If it excludes all such, then it seems gratuitous to say that the propositions are anything less than wholly equivocal. Consequently, philosophers like Clark and theologians like Robert L. Raymond insist that for any analogy actually to communicate something true about God or about anything else, there must be some element of univocalness or univocity to it. In other words, some quality that may be attributed as truly to one member of the analogy as to the other. So for instance, if we say that God is wise and we say that 
Denny down here is wise, we mean the same thing by the word wise in both instances. At least we mean some of the same thing in both instances, because if we mean none of the same thing in both instances, then when we say God is wise and that Dennis is wise, we might mean by Dennis is wise what we'd have uh, had meant had we said God is foolish. All right. Dennis, sorry. <laughs> All right. Now, um, let's see. Now let us contrast these senses of analogy with Van Til's, or at least with various attempts to define Van Til's. Bonson, whose massive Van Til's apologetic is probably the most thorough study and determined defense of Van Til's thought, having written, quote, that Van Til speaks of human knowledge as being analogical of God's knowledge, unquote, immediately added, this may not be a familiar way of speaking. And in a footnote, he wrote, from a pedagogical perspective, I would, have, I would not have preferred to use this kind of summary tag word for what Van Til was trying to teach. Although it is certainly possible to understand what he meant by the, the expression, this way of speaking probably occasioned more avoidable misunderstanding and misrepresentation from a small circle of critics than anything else he wrote. Forgive me if I take Bonson's from a pedagogical perspective, I would not have preferred to use this kind of summary tag word as meaning approximately, if Van Til's intent was to teach, this expression was bound to fail. In his Introduction to Systematic Theology, Van Til wrote of his doctrine of analogical knowledge this way, quote, if then every fact that confronts me is revelational of the personal and voluntary activity of the self-contained God, it follows that when I try to think God's thoughts after him, that is to say, when I try to make a system of my own, my system will at every point be analogical of the system of God. On the other hand, since the human mind is created by God and is therefore in itself naturally revelational of God, the mind may be sure that its system is true and corresponds on a finite scale to the system of God. That is what we mean by saying that it is analogical to God's system. It is dependent upon God's system. And by being dependent upon God's system, it is of necessity a true system. Similarly, in his introduction to Benjamin Warfield's The Inspiration and Authority of the Bible, Van Til wrote, when the Christian restates the content of scriptural revelation in the form of a system, such a system is based upon and therefore analogous to the existential system that God himself possesses. Being, believe, being based upon God's revelation, it is on the one hand fully true and on the other hand at no point identical with the content of the divine mind. Now Mether, in a paper written for the OPC Presbytery of the South in 2009, offered this explanation, quote, by analogy or analogical knowledge, Van Til set forth the reformed principle of humanity reinterpreting experience by thinking God's thoughts after him. Mether described man's knowledge as, quote, derivative or analogical, apparently as if the former term uh, were in this context synonymous with the latter. In other words, the word or there meant the same thing as that is. Both Bonson and Mether also wrote of Van Til's concept of analogy as expressing the difference between God's knowledge as archetypal and man's as ectypal. To quote only Mether, God contains certain capacities and characteristics in himself. He alone is the archetype. Humanity, as created in the image of God, enjoys a derivative, creaturely, yet genuine existence. We are the ectype. Our being is derivative. We are the image of God. And our knowledge is derivative. We do not possess archetypal knowledge, but rather ectypal knowledge. Now, as an implication or corollary of this, Van Til held that God's knowledge and man's knowledge, quote, coincide at no point in the sense that, and the emphasis there is Bonson's, in the sense that in his awareness of the meaning of anything, in his mental grasp or understanding of anything, man is at each point dependent upon a, a, an a priori act of unchangeable understanding and revelation on the part of God. 
Now, Clark and others have criticized Van Til on this, not for saying that man's knowledge is dependent on God's, nor for saying that man's knowledge is necessarily incomplete or finite, while God's is complete or infinite, nor for saying that God and man's, uh, uh, God's and man's acts of knowing are qualitatively different. God knows all instantly, eternally, exhaustively, and intuitively because he knows himself, while man learns things gradually, over time, partially, and discursively, to all of which uh, the critics would agree, but rather for saying that God's knowledge and man's, quote, coincide at no point. Now, I find it difficult to understand why Van Til would define the phrase coincide at no point as meaning that one's knowledge is dependent on another's. I might, for instance, say that I had learned from my statistician friend Ross McKittrick that a hack-robust statistical analysis of weather balloon and satellite global temperature measurements from 1960 through 2012 indicate that there was no trend from 1960 to 1977 and none from 1977 to 2012, but only a stepwise upward shift in late 1977, consequent to a shift in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation from negative to positive, and therefore that my knowledge of that was derivative of his. But I wouldn't conclude, therefore, that my knowledge and his coincide at no point, though his does vastly outstrip mine, and I doubt that it would occur to any of you to say likewise of anything you have learned from anyone else. It would be natural to think, but Van Til clarifies by saying, in the sense that man is at each point dependent upon a prior act of unchangeable understanding and revelation by God. But in the complaint against Clark's ordination, Van Til and his co-authors wrote specifically that God's knowledge and man's do not, quote, coincide at, any, at a single point, quote, unquote, that a proposition does not, quote, have the same meaning for man as for God, unquote, that man's knowledge is, quote, analogical to the knowledge God possesses, but it never can be identified with the knowledge, unquote, God quote, possesses of the same proposition, unquote, and that man could not have the same thought content in his mind that God has in his mind. Various writers have sought to defend Van Til by interpreting him differently from Clark and other critics. Bonson, for instance, calls Van Til's use of the term thought content in denying that man can have the same thought content in his mind that God has in his mind, a, quote, vague expression, unquote, that, quote, has played havoc in many a theological and philosophical dispute, unquote, adding, quote, its ability to generate confusion was conspicuous in the Clark Van Til controversy. And then Bonson offers this explanation. I believe that by thought content, Van Til meant the thinking activity in which the mind of God engages, which mental experience is metaphysically different from the operations of man's mind. Perhaps. But wonders, one wonders whether it is really so difficult to distinguish between thought content and thinking activity as to necessitate the misunderstanding and confusion with which many learned scholars have inter interpreted Van Til. In years past, I have often thought that George Washington was the first president of the United States, as I wrote at the moment that I was writing this lecture, and as I am rethinking now. Um, I am thinking that again at this moment. As I understand it, my thought content is the proposition George Washington was the first president of the United States. And that proposition was the same 10 years ago that it is now. But my thinking activity or act of thinking that proposition today is not the same thinking activity that occurred 10 years ago. Bonson argued that Van Til's denial that man can have, quote, the same thought content in his mind that God has in his, refers exclusively to the subjective thinking activity of God and the subjective thinking activity of man. He likened this, this distinction to that between the thinking activities of two human beings. Quote, the word knowledge can signify the actual act of knowing as a personal event, 
In this sense, my knowing, act of knowing, is not identical with your knowledge, act of knowing, just as my driving a car cannot be identical with your driving a car, since we are different actors. Consequently, he wrote, to say that the creator's act of knowing does not coincide with the creature's act of knowing should be non-controversial. Well, yes, it should. It should be so obvious as to be trivial. Yet thought content, which I take to be synonymous with idea, and act of thinking, do not, prima facie, seem to mean the same thing. And I'm not at all sure that Bonson has interpreted Van Til properly or that Clark and his other critics have misinterpreted him as Bonson argues. Now, before you start trying to figure out how to prove me wrong in my interpretation of Van Til and Bonson right, hear me carefully. My intent is not to prove this or that interpretation of Van Til on this point is right or wrong. It is instead to suggest that this exemplifies an underlying difficulty with Van Til's writing, namely his proclivity to use terms in non-standard and hence confusing ways. If all Van Til ever me meant by calling man's knowledge analogical is that it is derivative, i.e. derived from a source outside man and therefore contingent in contrast to God's, which is original, intuitive, and non-contingent, non because it is knowledge of himself, then no biblically orthodox theologian should object to the substance of his view. But first, if that is the case, then it seems quite inexplicable why so many theologians and philosophers, otherwise able scholars, both defenders and critics, have thought Van Til was saying something highly significant and even fairly original in the history of theology and why so many critics have thought he was saying something at least mildly and perhaps catastrophically mistaken. And second, if all Van Til meant by thought content was act of thinking, then Van Til's critics still have a legitimate complaint against his non-standard use of the term analogical because it was guaranteed to occasion extensive misunderstanding. The words analogy and analogical as used in logic, epistemology, and theology generally simply have not normally outside of Van Til and some, not all even, of his own followers typically meant der derivation and uh, uh, derivative any more than the phrase thought content has meant act of thinking. Through the whole history, the terms were used very differently. Van Til wanted to invest them with a new meaning. Well. Try as I might, I have found no definition of analogy in any English dictionary that even closely resembles, let alone matches, Van Til's. It is permissible for writers to assign special meanings to terms within the confines of their own work, uh, so long as in so doing, they make it clear that their sense differs from the standard sense. But so far as I can tell, Van Til, Van Til never acknowledged this about his use of the term analogical and therefore it is understandable that many of his readers would have misunderstood him, thinking he intended something similar, if not identical, to the standard meaning. Now let us turn to the other point on which Clark and others like Raymond have sharply criticized Van Til, his doctrine of the, the paradoxical knowledge of human knowledge. Uh, pardon me, the paradoxical nature of human knowledge. And on this point, I shall be brief. In his Common Grace and the Gospel, Van Til wrote, quote, Antinomies, another word for paradoxes, are involved in the fact that human knowledge can never be completely comprehensive knowledge. Every knowledge transaction has in it somewhere a reference point to God. Now, since God is not fully comprehensible to us, we are bound to come into what seems to be contradictions in all our knowledge. Our knowledge is analogical and therefore must be paradoxical. Now, for present purposes, I shall only mention in passing that Van Til's inference here from the incompleteness of knowledge to its necessarily being paradoxical seems a non sequitur. He seems to offer us a conclusion, all man's knowledge is paradoxical, and a single, minor, premise, all man's knowledge is incomplete. In this partial syllogism, the major term is paradoxical, the minor term is man's knowledge, and the middle term is incomplete. What is missing from the syllogism is the major premise, which for the argument to be valid in form would have to be 
all incomplete knowledge is paradoxical. But that premise is demonstrably false in that a thinker whose knowledge was limited to only the two propositions, Richard III was a king of England and volleyball is a sporting game, would have incomplete knowledge, but there would be no paradox, no apparent contradiction between those two parts of his knowledge. To return to what Van Til wrote, in the same book he wrote, italicizing for emphasis, all teaching of scripture is apparently contradictory. And again, quote, all the truths of the Christian religion have of necessity the appearance of being contradictory. We do not fear to accept that which has the appearance of being contradictory. In the case of common grace, as in the case of every other biblical doctrine, we should seek to take all the, th the factors of scripture teaching and bind them together into systematic relations with one another as far as we can. But we do not expect to have a logically deducible relationship between one doctrine and another. We expect to have only an, analo an analogical system. Clark, Raymond, and others have expressed various criticisms of this idea. Among them, first, that it assumes that the one who holds it knows everything every human now, in the past, or in the future ever will know, and knows that none of them will be able to reconcile the apparent contradiction. Second, that if actually non-contradictory truths can appear as contradictories, and if no amount of study or reflection can remove the contradiction, there is no available means to distinguish between this apparent contradiction and a real contradiction. Which implies, third, that it is impossible to conclude that any doctrine is false by pointing out that it contradicts another doctrine thought to be true. And hence, fourth, that we might as well dispense with theology exams for ordination. In this instance, I will not take the time to survey the attempts to interpret and defend Van Til on this point. Let us, assume, let us assume that they are correct. That is, the defenses of Van Til. Let us assume that they are correct. My point is not that Van Til was wrong about this, though I think he was, and Clark right, though I think he was, but that Van Til's doctrine of paradox was inherently confusing at best, as was his doctrine of analogy. And now let me say why I have so emphasized the difficulty of interpreting Van Til on these two doctrines of analogical and paradoxical human knowledge. It is because of the tragic consequences for Christ's church, or at least for one part of it, the Reformed faith, mostly in the United States. And here I can do no better than to offer you some excerpts from John Frame's discussion of the Clark Van Til controversy in his Cornelius Van Til an analysis of his thought. And this will be an extended quotation from Frame. In my estimation, both the Van Til party and the Clark party had valid scriptural concerns. Van Til was concerned to maintain the creator-creature distinction in the area of human knowledge. Clark was concerned to protect the integrity of divine revelation, to ensure that it could provide a true communication from God to man. The report, that is the report of the General Assembly, which generally favored Van Til, but did not reverse the Presbytery's ordination of Clark, did, in my opinion, do justice to Clark's concern about revealed truth. It repudiated the complaints, the complaint against Clark, language about different meanings and its denial of coincidence at a single point. In this respect, the report made real progress toward a resolution of the questions. Still quoting here. Did Clark do justice to Van Til's concerns about the creator-creature distinction? Probably not, in my view, but that was due in large measure to the confusing way in which the Van Til party stated the question. Had Clark been willing to bend his prejudice against formulations dealing with subjective experience a bit, I see no reason why he could not have affirmed an experiential difference between God's knowledge and man's. I agree fully with Frame at that point. Certainly, there was nothing in his theory of knowledge to rule out such a distinction. Indeed, I believe that that distinction is implicit in Clark's point about the difference in mode between God's knowledge and man's, God's being intuitive, man's being discursive. Frame then offered several suggestions as to how to reconcile Clark's and Van Til's thoughts, some of which I think hold some promise, others of which I find completely unpersuasive. Next, Frame rehearsed 
Van Til's later critiques of Clark and defenses of himself, finding in them both strengths and weaknesses. I shall bypass those. What is crucial, and what I embrace wholeheartedly, is his conclusion. Quote, I must reluctantly conclude that Van Til's response to Clark in An Introduction to Systematic Theology sheds more heat than light on this controversy. With the benefit of hindsight, Van Til could have come up with formulae such as I suggested earlier that would have drawn the parties together without compromising anyone's theological concern. Instead, he went on the offensive, employing the great gulf language of antithesis but with an argument so weak in both interpretation and criticism as to be quite unworthy of him. Still quoting, here we see Van Til as a movement leader. He was leading his troops against those of Clark with the sharpest antith antithetical rhetoric, taking no prisoners, admitting not the slightest shade of truth in Clark's formulations, suggesting that Clark's entire effort was marred by a false principle, saying that there were no fundamentals in common between himself and Stuart Hackett. Here he turns the same guns on Clark. We shall see this extremely antithetical side of Van Til again. I do believe that when he gets into this sort of mood, his normally powerful intellect often fails him. Van Til is a thinker who is normally capable of making careful, even subtle distinctions, but in his extreme antithetical mode, he tends to miss the obvious. Still quoting, this is not Van Til at his best, nor in my estimation did Clark's performance represent Clark at his best. Further, their warfare badly divided a denomination that was already very small and could ill afford such disunity. In time, Clark and many of his followers left the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I confess that I am appalled that at the 50th anniversary celebration of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in 1986, one speaker lauded the Van Tilian contenders for achieving a great victory for truth. In my opinion, truth was the great loser in the battle. Evidently, the only winner was pride, an unjustified pride at that. Still quoting. The controversy dealt for the most part with rather technical philosophical issues. I hope that my earlier part of my lecture indicated that, right? And I hope that a lot of you couldn't follow for the life of you a lot of that. That was precisely the point. The controversy dealt for the most part with rather technical philosophical issues that few of the OP, OPC elders, whether ruling or teaching, I might add, understood very well. Even Clark and Van Til were rather confused about them. Some of their disciples, even down to the present, have continued to prattle away about qualitative differences, propositional meaning, identity of thought content, single point of identity, twofold truth, and the like, without much idea of what they are talking about, but with the sublime assurance that they are right and that those who disagree with them are dangerous heretics. It is time for us to admit that these issues should never have been raised in such confusing terminology, that none of the confusing formulae should be made a test of orthodoxy, and that the Clark controversy was a low point in the life of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and in the ministries of the two major protagonists. And here is my heartfelt conclusion. Ha after having watched first as an outsider, then as an insider, and then again, as an outsider, some of the squabbles, not only about this, but also about many other highly technical and extra-confessional issues within the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Who is wise in understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace. 
by those who make peace. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself becoming, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. And I would add, in your brothers and sisters who disagree with you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Amen. And that's the end of my prepared remarks. Three okay. questions. All right. So I'm going to look for the angriest people we can find. <laughs> uh, before we take those, I want to step outside of the lecture again and ask you all to, at your first opportunity, go to cornwallalliance.org slash energy empowers the poor, cornwallalliance.org slash energy empowers the poor, and please sign the petition that you will read there. It's very short. Uh, sign it and ask your friends to go there as well. That's a major part of the work that we're doing at the moment. So, and then for those of you who came in late, I'll note that there are some handouts down here, not part of the lecture related to my other work. Okay. Why do a lot of people believe that Clark was an historian? Um, I didn't review that part of Clark's thinking on this. It was probably the early 90s when I last read about that, so I am going to beg off. Um, I think they were probably mistaken. Uh, I, I do remember having read significantly on that at the time, and I think that they were mistaken, but. I can't remember their arguments or his or or why I think they're wrong. Just can't. Hi. Um, as as much as uh, Arminianism over at the Trinity Foundation is spoken out against. Um, yes. What do you think about Robbins and Clark having published that theoretically Arminians could still be saved or regenerated people? I agree with them one hundred percent. That is, justification is by, faith, by, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, not in the proposition that justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Thank you, Chris. Okay? Um, yeah. Um, I, it, the implications of Scripture, the propositions that are implied from Scripture, could be quite a big spectrum. Oh, you bet. <laughs> could, could you yeah. give an example of where Clark kind of fell along the spectrum of what he thought were the kind of things that were implied by Scripture and a boundary where it would be too far? Oh, uh, where I would say Clark was going too far? On, oh, no, where, oh. where, how, how far would, was Clark willing to go? Can you give me like an example of a proposition that might seem to some people like a stretch, but he says this is clearly implied by Scripture, and then okay. maybe a proposition where he says, no, this, this is just not 
it's going too far where other people might think, oh, but I thought that was. Just uh, to me, kind of define it. Yeah, let me, let me uh, I gotta think on that a second. Um, the first thing that popped to my mind would have been uh, in terms of what he thinks maybe you could properly, validly deduce from scripture in an area where a lot of people might disagree with him. Um, I'm pretty sure that Clark would, have, would, would, would say that government wealth transfers, uh, taking property from some people and giving it to others to whom it doesn't belong, are, uh, are wrong in principle. Um, and there are plenty of Christians who disagree with him about that. I happen to agree with him. Uh, I don't think the Eighth Commandment says you shall not steal unless you are the government. Um, uh, now let me see if I can think of one where he would say so-and-so thinks you can deduce this, but I don't agree. Um, actually, on a similar subject, uh, some folks um, on the, the evangelical uh, left will argue from Leviticus 25, the Jubilee principle, that that required an occasional redistribution of wealth and he would argue that they were wrongly exegeting the passage. And again, I would agree with him there as well. So well, those would be two examples, but I, it would take a while to, to think up some thank others. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Well, thank you.